You say Santaron. No, I said Santaron. <laughs> <laughs> Harbo can't say Santaron. <laughs> Oh great, time for me to make an entire video about a monster whose name I can't even say properly. One of the main things Russell T Davies did as Doctor Who showrunner was slowly reintroduce monsters and villains from the original run of the show. Series 1 saw the return of the Daleks, Series 2 was the reimagining of the Cybermen, and Series 3 resurrected the Doctor's Time Lord foe, the Master. This was essentially the main trio of famous Doctor Who enemies, so when it came to Series 4, Davies decided to think outside of the box, electing to bring back the popular potato-like monsters, the Sontarans, who had appeared multiple times after their introduction in the Season 11 story, The Time Warrior. To bring back the beloved baked potatoes, Davies approached Helen Rayner, who was initially very reluctant, because the intensely negative fan reception to her previous story, Evolution of the Daleks, had driven her to tears. Stay classy, Doctor Who fans. Great job. However, Raynor agreed to return, eventually writing the two-part story, The Sontaran Stratagem, The Poison Sky, which also saw the return of Martha Jones and the organisation Unit. Fans often call this one of the weakest Series 4 stories, but does this two-parter about killer satnavs and cloning have something to prove, or does it fall short after all? Is that a reference to my height? The cold open of part one actually cheats somewhat, since it spends quite a while setting things up. Usually, cold opens are just about a minute long, just establishing some basic things, but this episode takes a full three minutes to get to the titles, which is actually a very good choice because it has a lot more to set up. Firstly, there's the more traditional cold open, with a journalist getting thrown out of a millennial nerd academy who are responsible for Atmos. Both Atmos and the Academy are immediately shown to be dangerous presences because Rattigan talks to an alien voice about terminating the journalist before she can expose them, using Atmos to do so because it's within every car and can't be disabled. It tells you everything you need to know about the threat within the episode, placing all the building blocks in a convenient way like a cold open should do. It tells us that Atmos is worldwide and it can't be disabled, it's linked to deaths across the globe, so we already get a sense as to the scale of this sinister alien scheme within the first minute and a half of the story. This is something that poses a big threat and needs to be stopped since it's in every car and aliens can just hijack it to drown you in a river. This death would usually be the cue for the titles to come stinging in, but it's not since there's one other big aspect the episode has to set up an aspect that truly deserves to be the opening cliffhanger. This aspect begins with Donna flying the TARDIS, which is possibly one of the worst decisions the Doctor has ever made, but it gives us a fun, cheeky reference to the 80s being such a wacky and wild decade, since the Doctor suggests someone put a dent in it, explaining quite a lot when you think about it. However, then a phone starts ringing, none other than Martha Jones on the other end, saying she's bringing him back to Earth. This is a great stinger for the episode because it's so unexpected, yet it's the logical payoff for her leaving her phone in the TARDIS at the end of Last of the Time Lords. This is the first present day story since Partners in Crime, which was itself a very self-contained story that needed to reintroduce Donna. However, because of how interconnected and cohesive the Davies era was, it makes a lot of sense for Martha to once again be involved, now that they're back in modern day. Unlike Rose and Martha, Donna wants a proper escape from Earth, and this isn't a one-off trip. So stories like Aliens of London and The Lazarus Experiment wouldn't fit this characterisation and setup. She and the Doctor almost have to be forced back to Earth, which is what this phone call achieves, keeping that cohesiveness and paying off Martha still being around in the present day. Doctor, it's Martha, and I'm bringing you back to Earth. We then get the reunion of the Doctor and his last companion. It's a really nice moment, like two genuine friends happy to see each other again after a long time. We also get a sense that the events of the Series 3 finale are still ingrained within Martha's mind, and her family is still recovering from it all. This is smart because it keeps the emotional rawness of that finale. She and her family suffered through so much that it wouldn't be fair for them to have just completely moved on and gone back to normal life after all that. It continues that cohesion, especially because it led to Martha becoming part of of unit. Donna then gets to meet her predecessor and the scene is essentially school reunion in a microcosm. However, they cut out all the drama and contention, cutting straight to the scene where Rose and Sarah Jane started laughing about the Doctor. It also shows a sense of development for the Doctor as a character. After going through Martha's unrequited love and realising it was his fault, he made sure to be upfront about her to Donna, making sure it wouldn't happen again. He didn't make Donna think she was the first to travel with him, he's always been upfront regarding Rose and Martha, so Donna isn't jaded or upset like Rose was when she found out she was just another companion. Similarly, Martha herself knew she was a replacement for Rose before her, 
her, because the Doctor never shut up about her, so Martha doesn't get jealous like Sarah Jane did when she found out about Rose. These are two characters who are more than familiar with what life is like travelling with the Doctor, and they know they're part of a long list of companions, so they aren't at odds, allowing for this more friendly, respectful dynamic. It's like meeting a friend of a friend who you've been told a lot about, so it's nothing special, nothing to be mad or emotional about, it's just someone you have a mutual friend with, so there's a nice sense of normality there mixed in with all of this alien chaos. However, it then turns out that Martha has become a member of UNIT, the military group with an ever-changing purpose and mission statement depending on who's writing the story. This is the first big, proper UNIT story of the modern era of Doctor Who. They had been offhandedly introduced in Aliens of London, and played a minor role in the Christmas Invasion, but I would say this is the first time they've had a proper, focused presence since the show returned in 2005. I like how they're established as a military force. Classic Who fans would have been familiar with their more scientific approach in the 70s, but here they're more like they were in the 1989 serial Battlefield, with their marching, storming a factory, Martha calling the shots to the sound of UNIT rocks, which is a great piece of music, very fitting for the scene in the organisation. It's a very frantic start to the episode, but then Donna drops that spine-chilling bomb of a line. Is that what you did to her? Turned her into a soldier? Even without the later context of the Stolen Earth, this line is so weighty for showing the consequences of travelling with the Tenth Doctor. He lives his life and his adventures at such a fast, dangerous pace that it would understandably create this kind of effect on a companion when they leave. We already saw it with Mickey in Army of Ghosts, him coming back as a battle-hardened soldier after fighting the Cybermen in the parallel world. But this is a more extreme example, because Martha is now part of this big military organisation, even if she is just a medic. As I mentioned a minute ago, she went through so much in the series 3 finale. It was a story that really hardened her, because of her year travelling around the broken and tortured planet, trying to bring down an oppressive regime all by herself, not being able to trust anyone. That was her turning point as a character, the story that made her become a soldier. It shows the significant personal effects of that adventure, how she couldn't just move on and live a normal life. She had to do something like she was doing with the Doctor, and UNIT serves that purpose, much to the Doctor and Donna's dismay. I do find it weird though that Torchwood the same year suggested that it was the Doctor who directly got her the job, despite him being so against UNIT. I guess maybe he just didn't know how army-like they had become. That I'd come highly recommended by an impeccable source. You mean... Well, who else would have done it? Indeed, he comes face to face with a new look unit and their command lorry which kind of seems bigger on the inside. I love the nod to his stint as unit scientific advisor when he was the third doctor trapped on earth, since when he regenerated into the fourth doctor he kind of just left and then cropped up every now and again. So as far as bureaucracy goes, he's still part of the organisation. He's just a really unreliable employee. I think this acknowledgement is good for exploring how unit has changed, because Donna is shocked that he worked for and technically still works for them, despite them now going against everything he fights for. Even back in the 70s, the Doctor had a contentious relationship with the Brigadier because of stories like Doctor Who and the Silurians, where the Brig committed genocide by blowing up the Silurians. Even though Donna has seen this better side of the Doctor, his involvement with this organisation would surely remind her of the side she first saw in The Runaway Bride, where he killed all of the Rachnos. You can understand her shock at what she might think is him being extra hypocritical, since she looks at them and sees this authoritarian, overly militaristic organisation arresting innocent factory workers, and her best friend is apparently part of their staff. You can see how that would be just a bit unsettling. Also, I do like that they give a little throwaway nod to the unit dating controversy, since the timeline of classic Who unit stories was completely thrown off thanks to the fifth Doctor story, Mordor and Undead, creating more of a brain disintegrator than the Aliens of London time skip, which I've spent entire nights trying to fix and just it doesn't work. It's nice to see the unit date and controversy acknowledged here, even if they don't really solve it, but then again it's practically impossible to solve because the timeline is so painfully messy. Yeah, long time ago, back in the 70s. The, the killer Satna from the beginning is once again brought up here because we find out that 52 people were poisoned within their cars at the exact same time across the world, with Atmos the only thing linking them together. We know this kind of hacking is possible because of the cold open, so it already justifies the Doctor and Unit being involved. It's very fishy for something like that to happen, especially with something so suddenly widespread as Atmos, which apparently reduces emissions to 0%, immediately tipping both the Doctor and the viewer off that this seems far too good to be true. 
There's a nice contrast between Donna, who thinks it might be aliens trying to help us clear up our atmosphere, and the Doctor, who immediately speculates it would be giving an alien race 800 million weapons. I think it's good for showing the differences between their outlooks on life and the universe. Donna, who wants to see the wonder of it all, wants it to be something good, whereas the Doctor is always seeing exploitation and warring during their adventures, so it makes sense that he wouldn't be as naive as Donna is here. As this is going on, there's a really creepy scene as two unit grunts investigate a tunnel, passing two zombified workers to get to a dark room with strange alien lab equipment, hearing banging from inside a giant container. It's all very reminiscent of a sci-fi horror movie, these two soldiers stumbling across something they shouldn't, this mysterious alien container with god knows what inside it. It plays upon our curiosity since Steve wants to be cautious and wait for backup, but the other soldier wants to open up the container straight away to find out what's inside and whether someone is trapped in there. They're both very human responses, signifying those two halves of our conscience in these situations. There's always that very careful and cautious side that wants to play it safe, but then there's also that nagging voice in your mind making you want to solve a mystery, since it's within our nature to hate not knowing something. Leaving a mystery like this unsolved would weigh on your mind for years. Eventually this curiosity proves to be their downfall. As they look into the goo and a weird humanoid body comes out. Again, this is a very sci-fi horror visual, since it's stark white and veiny, with a creepy mouth and an umbilical cord in the back of its neck. It looks so alien, while still looking human, which I think is why it's so creepy. It straddles that line of what we understand and what we don't, playing upon those instincts of familiarity within our own species. We then get our first look at a Centauran since the 1980s, as General Stahl arrives, lecturing the two soldiers on their ability to fight, deeming them unfit as warriors. This is very good for establishing the code and the concept of the monsters, how they're not just a dumb warrior race, they take great pride in their strategic thinking and tactical skill. As units stormed the base, the Centaurans observed their predictable tactics and weak weaponry, which exemplified their tactical nature. I mean hell, they managed to infiltrate and invade Gallifrey via the Doctor himself, so they know what they're doing, it's not a surprise that they're one step ahead of unit. The Santarans aren't just soldiers, they're scientists as well, which is kind of a mirror of UNIT themselves. Given that this was most of the audience's first encounter with the Santarans, I think this is a great introduction, telling you all the important aspects of them and their motivations as a villain, how qualified they are for war, even if they are a bit on the short side. I like that the soldiers try to mock Stahl for being short, just for him to easily dispatch of them, showing they're cocky and he's a better soldier. It tells you not to underestimate these aliens, they may be shorter than you, but they're smarter and have you outplayed before you even know they exist. So it's a scene that shows they're a real significant threat to the Doctor and the planet. I would rate you above average soldier, well done. Whereas you, you smell of sweat and fear. There's a really good scene between the Doctor and Martha which challenges his preconceptions of modern unit. He has a very black and white worldview of not liking people with guns, so he seems to disapprove of Martha for being associated with unit. But this is such a limited view of the organisation, really generalising them because Martha is actually trying to use her experiences with the Doctor to change them and make them less warring. Similar to how Captain Jack decided to reshape torture within the Doctor's vision. This is something he didn't even consider because he was so quick to dismiss them as being bad because they carry shooty bangs. He let his prejudices come first. It's a good way to revisit that Series 3 dynamic, the Doctor slipping into his old ways and underestimating Martha, taking her at face values and ignoring all the good things she's doing. However, someone they both underestimate is Donna, who shows up with an empty folder, putting her seemingly useless temp experiences to good use, as she investigates personnel to find that nobody in the factory has ever taken a sick day, which is definitely a red flag. It's stuff like this that shows Donna's worth. Unlike the Doctor and Martha, Donna looks in plain sight, using her common sense and not overcomplicating things. Her nature as a very ordinary person means she can just notice these seemingly irrelevant things, which everyone else skips over, all because she's so… normal. She doesn't skip and for alien tech, she looks at the obvious human answer. The following scene also gives Donna and Martha another good character moment, where Martha encourages Donna to tell her family where she is so they know. That experience at the end of Series 3 taught her a lot and she doesn't want Donna's family to go through similar hell. Martha kept trying to hide the truth from her family, causing issues with her mother and eventually getting them hurt. So here she has a chance to make sure Donna doesn't make the same mistakes as her. It's a good use of a former companion meeting the current companion, since they can almost teach their successor and stop them making the same mistakes. Having been down the same path, and being wizened to how best to deal with this new lifestyle. He's like fire. 
Stand too close and people get burnt. This conversation in turn leads to one of the best scenes in the episode. As Donna tells the Doctor she wants to go home, really emotional music playing as the Doctor tells her about all the places he wanted to take her. Because of that warning Martha gave about travelling with the Doctor, this feels like a goodbye. Donna suddenly leaving this life behind out of nowhere. It's a really well played misdirect because it tricks the audience as well as the Doctor, since Donna actually just wants to pop home and see her family, now that she's back in the present day. The acting, music and writing combine to make such a memorable scene reflecting how the Doctor is so used to losing people and this is so sudden to him. Even though it's kind of obvious she's not going to leave halfway through the fourth episode in the series, it's a brilliantly crafted moment that shows how great this combo is, these two characters working so well with each other for these comedic moments we all know and love. However, we then get a properly emotional moment as Donna returns home, everything all suddenly so normal, remembering the recent horror she's experienced, only to be rewarded by her dear old granddad outside her house. All that horror has been worth it, since she still gets to see him again. I think this is such a sweet, heartfelt reunion. Because he's this dreamer who loves the stars, he instantly believes her, so she's able to have that cathartic release Martha denied herself. It's good for Donna to finally be able to confide in someone about her new lifestyle, getting to tell Wolf all about it and him not even doubting it. It develops that close bond they have, which was established back in Partners in Crime, him being so supportive and encouraging her. Then Sylvia comes in and everything goes straight back to normal for Donna, since Sylvia doesn't have that kind of bond and wouldn't believe it. Again, like Partners in Crime established, she's this prickly and sarcastic presence in Donna's life, so as soon as she steps into the room, Donna is back to being the jobless, unambitious daughter Sylvia considers her to be, because she underestimates her daughter and doesn't know what she's capable of. I've just been travelling. Oh, hark at her, Michael Palin. The Doctor and his greatest ever companion, Ross Jenkins, then arrive at the Ratican Academy, with some great interplay in the Jeep to explain what the Academy is and why they still have Atmos in the unit vehicles, despite knowing it's bad. I love Ross, he's great, but I feel bad that this moment and his great joke is all just to humanise him for when he dies. It's very smart writing, but I hate it. Don't call Ross a grunt, he's nice, we like Ross. Ross's death is the most heartbreaking companion death in Doctor Who history. You can even see how hurt the Doctor is by his death, knowing the best companion has been sent to his death by a hateable colonel who knew it was a suicide mission. Seriously, I can't believe he doesn't pay for essentially killing Ross directly like this. No wonder the Doctor hates Unit. The Brig would have never done this with Yates or Benson. However, to get back on track, I love that the Doctor instantly susses out Ratican's plan to colonise another planet, along with him shutting down this smart-ass American super genius with a simple grammatical correction, proving that the Doctor is who YouTube commenters dream of being. It's been a long time since anyone said no to you, hasn't it? Rattigan had been able to get away with all of this stuff because he's smarter than everyone else and they don't question it, but that's because he hasn't met the Doctor yet, who questions everything. It's a great way to expose this big alien scheme, because the Doctor is the one person Rattigan and the Centaurans wouldn't have planned for, since he's such a rogue element who does whatever he wants, like teleporting onto a Centauran spaceship by pressing some buttons he likes the look of. This sequence really shows the dynamism and intelligence of the Doctor, being able to go toe to toe with Rattigan on an intellectual level, one-upping him and not playing Rattigan's games to entertain him. The scene also reveals the Doctor's familiarity with the Centaurans, as he confronts Stahl and actually shames them for hiding away like this. I feel like this is kind of like the Doctor voicing the concerns of Classic Who fans, who would probably hate how this episode handles the monster. They, like the Doctor, are familiar with the Centaurans, and know how they should work, but this episode changes that all up by making them scheme from the shadows instead of fighting like warriors. So it's good that the story acknowledges this shift in behaviour. The Doctor is on fire in this scene with some great one-liners and wit, but it's familiar familiarity with them also allows him to quickly dispatch of style to escape, exposing the Centauran weakness that comes up again later, using a tennis ball to disable this mighty alien warrior. This kind of sums the Doctor up, to be honest. Because we now know that Ratigan is involved with the Centaurans, we get a better idea of their combined scheme, the episode ramping up as they decide to launch their final phase now the system is widespread across the globe. It justifies the Doctor's instant speculation of the cars being weaponised, since he's proved to be absolutely right. It ramps these stakes up towards the episode's climax because now we have a better idea of what's going to happen, just how planned out this all is, and how dangerous the Centaurans are, paying off that building tension and threat throughout. Martha, who was captured earlier, is also strapped to a table as Strax, I mean Score, confronts her and reveals that the strange humanoid embryo from earlier is going to become her, taking her place and cloning her to infiltrate Unit and sabotage it from the inside. 
This is such a good ending to this aspect of the first part of the story. Having this fearless companion of the Doctor compromised and cloned, becoming useless, the Sontarans closing in on securing their success, with the extra motivation of knowing who the Doctor is and wanting the glory of destroying him, for not only being a Time Lord in the greatest war they weren't in, but also because they know him from those previous encounters in Classic Who. I think them name dropping the Time War is a subtle way of hinting towards the finale, since it reminds you of the conflict, just kind of nudging you because it's an important aspect to the finale, which is the same for the temporal pocket of the Atmos devices, which are hidden a second out of time, also the case for the stolen planets in that story. It's a really smart way of dropping hints and building towards the final story, even this early on, just leaving these little breadcrumbs for you to notice. Legend says he led the battle in the last great time war. The finest war in history and we weren't allowed to be part of it. However, before the episode ends, we get a very unexpected yet wonderful reunion as Wolf meets the Doctor again. This was obviously a scene rewritten once Wilf was retconned into Voyage of the Damned, but I like that they acknowledge this past meeting. Wilf was waiting for aliens this whole time on his hill, but little did he know that he already met one that wild Christmas Eve. He basically fanboys over the Doctor because it's an alien, amazed at being able to talk to one and touch one. It's simple character touches like this that make him so lovable. He's waited for this for a long time and he wants to relish this chance to make contact. All this time he's wanted to get out and meet aliens, but the aliens came to him in the end. It's just impossible to not love Wilf, and this scene is another reason why he's such a fan favourite. Sylvia also recognises the Doctor, but once again proves a stark, snarky contrast to Wilf, since she blames the Doctor for the chaos at Donna's wedding, suggesting bad things happen when he shows up. Which, you know, isn't exactly wrong to be honest, because it's at that moment that the Atmos devices get activated, poison gas being pumped out into every corner of the country and the world. We already knew how many cars had it, since even Partners in Crime showed that. So we already know the high stakes, but the visuals of the worldwide chaos and Wolf being trapped in the car all really add to the moment. It feels like there's nothing the Doctor can do. Much like Army of Ghosts, the invasion has kind of already happened. These cars were sleeper agents, and he's stuck there with no way of fixing it as the music intensifies, the Centaurans doing their war cries, it seems they've won. I love hopeless cliffhangers like this, everything in chaos and the Doctor unable to save the day. Obviously, you know they will, but it's always a great ending to an episode because it makes you excited to find out how they'll save the day. It's far from the greatest cliffhanger in Doctor Who, but it serves its purpose very well, providing a great payoff to the very slow build of the episode. However, as with most Doctor Who cliffhangers, this ending is resolved pretty quickly at the beginning of The Poison Sky, with Sylvia simply breaking the window of an axe to rescue Wilf. Much like the cliffhanger of the empty child, I'm not sure I like how quickly it's resolved. It's almost like Wilf just got into the car for no reason other than creating a dramatic personal cliffhanger for the protagonists. But that being said, I feel like this moment benefits from hindsight, because he does something very similar in the end of time, trapping himself in the glass nuclear power thing after blundering in there, resulting in the Doctor needing to regenerate as a consequence of saving him. Thanks to that later context, we understand that this is just who Wilf is, accidentally getting himself trapped in places and situations like like this, despite having the best intentions. He also continues that great character trait of supporting Donna, since Sylvia tries to stop her going along with the Doctor, because of him seeming to be a bringer of death and destruction, but Wilf encourages her, once again acting as that little angel on her shoulder wanting her to live her life to the fullest, and escape from the mediocrity of her life. So it's a good five minutes for fans of Wilf. Later, Donna calls her family from the TARDIS, finding out they're sealing themselves in to try and protect themselves. It shows those personal stakes, how individual people are being affected. They're not just dying, they're terrified because of what's going on around them. There's no way to fight this, it's just a slow, horrifying suffocation. It's a very emotional scene, because for all Donna knows, this is the last time she'll talk to her family. She might never see them again, they might die in this choking fog, but she believes in the Doctor, which they should too. It's similar to all of those scenes in Series 3, where Martha tells people to keep faith in the Doctor. Even though the Doctor is just one person, Donna knows how special they are, how much they're capable of, and how many planets they've saved. It's a good way of showing how much the Doctor means to Donna. She holds him to this pedestal, but she has good reason to, because she trusts him and believes in him. It's the scale of it, Donna. I mean, how can one man stop all that? Trust me, he can do it. Speaking of believing in the Doctor, at the end of the Centauran stratagem, the Centaurans replaced Martha with an evil clone. She starts to sabotage UNIT, concealing vital information from her superior and transferring UNIT security protocols to the Centaurans. Somehow. Yeah, not sure how this bit works here, but it's nothing that a little suspension of disbelief can't fix. 
She also helps the Centaurans beam the TARDIS on board their ship, stranding the Doctor on Earth along with putting Donna behind enemy lines. I love that the Doctor immediately susses Martha out as being off and not acting like herself. We saw it before with Cassandra possessing Rose in New Earth, so we know this incarnation is pretty good at recognising when his friends are acting out of character. Much like that episode, he keeps his cards close to his chest to play the long game, not wanting to reveal the deception because he can manipulate it for his own ends. He catches her out by asking whether she's phoned her family yet, because Martha cares so much about her family that her not worrying about them is a clear sign she's not herself. It's a smart way to keep Donna safe, since he would otherwise say to Martha he sent Donna to the TARDIS, but her laissez-faire attitude to the world ending is just a bit of a red flag to let him know not to trust Martha until he knows what's happened to her. Even though he's on the back foot pretty much everywhere else in this story, this is a moment where his intelligence is clear and his knowledge of his friends helps him a lot here. We then get the humans doing what humans do best, panicking and trying to launch missiles. Yes, now that most of the Earth's militaries know the source is coming from above the planet, they all want to launch nukes at it because that has always worked out well, hasn't it? These kinds of moments show why the Doctor stands out from us as a species, because he steps in as an overriding authority to parlay with the Suntarans and talk to them under the rules of engagement, refusing to just let war happen without them sitting down and talking. Because that's always worked out well, hasn't it? It's a good exploration of his differences to unit, showing just how much he hates their militaristic approach, along with the scene also kind of establishing the subwave network. Donna is able to see the Doctor talking without him seeing or hearing her, just like Rose is unable to be part of the intergalactic Zoom call in The Stolen Earth. Also, Rose pops up here if you have a keen eye, something I usually miss because I forget about it. It's a great mysterious easter egg because we saw her at the end of Partners in Crime, and here she is again, so subtly there, the episode once again building those foundations for The Stolen Earth. Not only is this parlay good for setting up this future story, but it's also good for exploring the Suntaran's motivations, since they're losing in their epic war with the giant green shape-shifting jellyfish known as the Rutans. This is another nod to Classic Who fans, who are always asking for the Rutans to return, but it's good for explaining that very non-Suntaran behaviour of Stalin and his forces. Much like with their friends, the Doctor also knows when their enemies are acting strange and unlike themselves, so he can press their buttons here to get an answer, which we eventually find out is that they decided to terraform Earth as a new cloning planet, because their war isn't going very well. Because the Doctor knows their friends and foes so well, he not so subtly signals to Donna to call him from on board the ship. The Centaurans are smart, but only when it comes to war and strategy. They don't really understand much else, so he can slip these hints through pretty well, knowing Donna is watching the exchange. I think this is remarkably similar to how he stopped the Cybermen in Age of Steel, using hints to help Mickey access and send the code to stop the Cyberman army, all through the use of CCTV and trust. So it's a good callback to that earlier story. Telephonic device for communication, sort of symbolic. Like if only we could communicate. You and I. Donna trusts the Doctor, but he also trusts her, now enacting his plan of helping her infiltrate the Centauran ship. I like that she constantly doubts herself, falling into that negative mindset Sylvia has. However, much like Wilf, the Doctor keeps encouraging her because he believes in her potential. This continues to show how good they are for each other, how they bring the best out of one another. The Doctor knows it's a tough thing to ask Donna to do, making her risk certain death, but he knows she can do it, she just needs to trust in her own abilities. As soon as she successfully knocks her Centauran out, it's like a wave of confidence flushes over her, since she's proved to herself that she is capable after all. This Ben Kenobi infiltration mission is usually a suicide mission, with these huge stakes furthered as Centauran after Centauran pass by her, just reminding her how much danger she's in. While she's on the ship, the humans below mount a big comeback, turning the tide now they have more effective weapons and the Valiant to clear the smoke around the factory. Colonel Mace gives this rousing, yet kind of hollow speech, trying to inspire his troops, but you can just tell the Doctor is seething at all this. He knows how suicidal it is to fight Centaurans head on. Fighting like this is exactly what they want, an all out war which is also exactly what people want out of Centauran stories. In classic Who stories like the Centauran experiment and the two doctors, they were a limited presence despite us constantly being told that they're a warrior race, but here they get a proper battle, showing their obsession with war and honour since they prefer the honourable kills of those they're fighting, rather than committing war crimes by killing fleeing soldiers. It becomes a proper battle though, casualties on both sides as unit finally regain a foothold and show they're not as weak as the Centauran 
Centaurans estimated. Someone who definitely wasn't underestimated by the Centaurans is Rattigan, who reveals to his cult, I mean Academy, that his grand plan for them has been to move to another planet and colonise it. But I love that they all just reject him and realise he's crazy. They don't want to leave Earth, they just go to a school for smart people like them. They didn't sign up for this crazy American kid telling them to go to an alien planet to breed and create a new human race. Sure, Rattigan is smart and can create so many things, but he lacks that human connection, so he didn't plan for these people turning him down. It's unfathomable to him, because he's so used to being surrounded by yes men and people who do whatever he wants. It's been a long time since anyone said no to you, hasn't it? He planned all this colonisation without thinking about the other people involved. He just thought about himself because he's a raging narcissist. As soon as they say no to him, he flips out and loses control. Again, because he's not used to this kind of situation. So he spirals out of control and flies into a desperate incel rage. He believes smart people are excluded and mocked, which is why he wants a new world of big brain people. But it's actually just him. He's not excluded and mocked because he's smart. He's excluded and mocked because he's so narcissistic and has this fragile sense of ego. The other people have no reason to leave Earth behind. They don't seem like they get mocked or excluded, they're just smart people. So I really like how Rattigan's plan completely falls apart, since the Santarans just wanted to use his influence. Another person they wanted to use is Martha, with the Doctor finally finding the original, real Martha and revealing he knew the deception all along. As I said earlier, it's good for his intelligence because he never fell for the trick, he simply used it to his advantage, allowing her to keep stopping the nukes because it worked in his favour as well as the Centaurans. Much like Rattigan with the human element, the Centaurans didn't plan for the Doctor element. They played right into his hands and allowed him to move the pieces into place, to pull a massive Uno reverse card now that he saved Martha. I really like the resulting scene of the two Marthas interacting. The real Martha didn't really get much time in the episode, but this is a very powerful moment for her nonetheless. Even though Though this clone took her place and tried to help destroy the world, she is very sympathetic to her, knowing it wasn't her fault and she was just being controlled by the Centaurans. This scene here is just so Martha Jones. It's so human and compassionate, Martha wishing she could save her clone from death, but she can't. It ends up becoming a chat between herself and her own conscience, since the clone has all her memories and ambitions, all her plans for the future and her dreams. It's essentially Martha being able to realise how short life is, because she watches herself die right in front of her along with having almost died in Torchwood when an alien gauntlet latched onto her face and turned her into an old woman. This moment is Martha being confronted by the inevitability of death, so it's a good chance for her to realise she needs to get on and achieve these goals, because one day she'll die, just like her clone. So it's a very weighty moment. In your mind you've got so many plans, there's so much that you want to do, and I will. Donna then finishes her Ben Kenobi mission without dying, allowing the trio to teleport into the Rattigan Academy and all reunite. However, thanks to all of Rattigan's terraforming equipment, the Doctor can actually save the day, so it's a good way to reincorporate that whole Rattigan Academy angle, making it more significant. However, I do feel like the climax of the story is a bit sudden and half-baked. Sure, the whole terraforming angle was established early on, but it all just kind of happens very quickly. The Doctor just burning the atmosphere to somehow fix everything? I can't help but feel bad for any birds or planes or people in skyscrapers. They probably got torched in this devastating fire. However, they slap the Doctor Forever on it and show Wolf being happy, so I can forgive it and appreciate the moment for what it is. Igniting the atmosphere isn't the true end though, that's just to stop the whole cloning thing. Now there's a spaceship full of angry Centaurans ready to destroy the planet. Seems like a big deal, right? Oh wait, there are only about 6 minutes of runtime left, so don't get your hopes up that they'll do anything with it. The Doctor decides to sacrifice himself to blow up the ship, planning to commit mass genocide, even if he does want to talk the Centaurans down first. It continues that ongoing theme of Series 4, of the Doctor needing to make these weighty, genocidal decisions. He had to destroy Pompeii and now he has to wipe out every Sontaran on the ship, killing hundreds of thousands of them. However, as Stahl says, the Doctor doesn't have the heart to do it. I do like this establishment of his empty threat. The Doctor has committed so many genocides and killed so many people, it's not exactly something he wants to do again. However, this leaves you with a bit of a conundrum as to how to destroy the little potato boys. This conundrum, however, is instantly solved, as Rattigan decides to redeem himself by blowing the ship up, getting revenge on the Sontarans for betraying him. Much like the ignition of the atmosphere, I feel like this all comes too suddenly, which is always a shame of a two-parter because it has more time. It just kind of ends, this half-hearted sacrifice by the Doctor suddenly becoming this attempt at redeeming this wholly unlikable character you care nothing for. I like almost everything else about this episode, but I feel as though it's resolved a bit too quickly and could have been solved a bit better in a smarter way. I just think this was a bad way to 
finish it. You're going to ignite them. You'll kill yourself. However, despite this, the episode still ends on a good note. We get that wholesome post-action with Wilf telling Donna to go with the Doctor and bring a bit of the stars back for him. Him once again being such a sweet and supportive figure for her, knowing how much she wants to travel with the Doctor, so he's happy to encourage her to follow her dreams. Then, Martha gets the choice to rejoin the TARDIS and return to this lifestyle, ultimately deciding not to. I like this refusal because if Martha chose to start travelling again, it would fly in the face of her decision to leave in the first place. I also think that her earlier conversation with her clone influences this decision not to return, since her clone reminded her about all her plans and her dreams. If she flew off in the TARDIS again, it would be running away and putting off achieving these goals, so she's once again choosing the better life for herself, a life she can be comfortable with and enjoy more, being there for her fiancé Tom from Last of the Time Lords, or as every YouTube comment points out, the guy from Lucifer. Yes, I know who he is. However, despite her deciding to stay on Earth, the TARDIS has other ideas, jetting off with them all on board, despite the Doctor not doing anything. This is a great cliffhanger to the story, creating a real mystery and hook for the next episode, much like a lot of Classic Who serials did. Even though the Doctor's daughter is a separate story, I like the fact there's a lead-in, keeping viewers interested since there's a direct link between the two narratives, connecting them, so it's a good way to end the story with a sense of danger and intrigue. The Centauran Stratagem and the Poison Sky are an interesting pair of episodes that I'm not quite sure how to rank, because it's sadly a kind of forgettable story, coming off the back of the stellar first three episodes. It's a great reintroduction of Martha Jones, continuing her story and following a similar path of school reunion, with this exploration of life after the Doctor, and meeting another companion from before or after you met the Doctor. The two-parter is also a good return for the Centaurans, even though I know it might irritate a lot of Classic Who fans who love the monster. I think their presence is justified, with a good redesign and some good writing, making them this calculated, efficient warrior race we were always told they were. However, I think the plot leaves a bit to be desired, since whole pollution atmospheric stuff falls short, along with the ending being wrapped up a bit too quickly and suddenly. That being said, the episode had a lot to explore and to set up, so I don't think the plot is too much of a detriment. I think the main trio were characterised really well with some great character moments, along with some wonderful Wilf moments showing Donna's personal connection to Earth. The music is also great as always, along with units serving as a fun military presence to mirror the Centaurans and contrast the Doctor's morals. Overall, I think I'd give this story a C on the Series 4 tier list. It has a lot to juggle, even with two episodes, and there are certainly some pacing issues, but I don't think it's as bad as people often say it is. It's a crucial story for setting up a lot of the elements of the finale, which I think it does well. It's a story which serves a larger purpose, but it's definitely a bit of a mixed bag on its own. However, there's enough going for it to make it an enjoyable ride nonetheless, although the existence of Strax has kind of damaged it in hindsight, because it makes the Centaurans a bit hard to take seriously as a threat. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my gold level patrons, Daniel Shilato, John, Mark Hippolgai Taylor, and Stephanie Neville Miller. Thank you a lot for your support. <laughs>